Now, on to the main event. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Lisa and Heather, who both are at Tamarack Institute. Lisa works um, with cities and organizations to improve the way they engage with their communities. Over the last five years, her work has focused on creating authentic engagement strategies for mu municipalities and organizations, integrated communications planning, and the use of technology and creativity for engagement. And Heather's role at the Institute as the manager of cities, cities deepening community, is to help cities to strengthen neighborhoods through an asset-based approach, multi-sector engagement, and the development of neighborhood and city strategies. She brings over 12 years of public health knowledge to this position. I will now turn things over to Lisa, uh, and you are welcome to post questions um, in the chat box as I see some one has already done. Thank you for starting things off, Diane. And um, I'm going to mute myself now. Thanks. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at Tamarack and so it's my, uh, my privilege to be here today and to talk to you more about community engagement um, as it's the world that I spend uh, the majority of my time in. Um, so a little bit more about Tamarack before um, we jump into the, the meat of it, um, just so you can understand the role that we play and why, why we're here today. Um, so Tamarack um, helps equip change makers um, from across Canada and globally as well in making whatever community change they're trying to make easier and more effective. And so we believe that there are these five interconnected practice areas um, that you can see there on the screen. And we believe those are really important to have a deep understanding of um, to, to make um, impactful community change. And my colleague Heather, who's joining us um, today as well, um, she, she's um, somebody who works deeply in our vibrant communities area. Hi, everybody. So, yeah, Heather Keen here. And um, I am so pleased to be here with you today. And um, as uh, part of TAMRAC, we have uh, an area called Vibrant Communities. And um, we actually, we use those five areas that Lisa just talked about um, to support our cities and local leaders in developing and implementing large scale change um, through two of our learning networks. Um, so we have Cities Reducing Poverty um, and they're working with a network of more than 175 cities. And um, we also have Cities Deepening Community, which is the one that I am a manager of cities with. And we are working with a network of 67 cities to to strengthen neighborhoods um, and help them in their their uh, citizen engagement uh, to reduce uh, loneliness in their communities. So we spend a lot of time um, thinking about community engagement and also a lot of time implementing it. And as we as we go from theory to practice, we then learn constantly as we go along. And so while the field of community engagement has been around for an incredibly long time. Um, we feel that it's a really um, active and constantly changing field. Um, and, a, you know, a lot has happened over the years um, to lead to that. Um, you know, the ability to engage online is something that couldn't be done 20 years ago. Um, and, and as well as the community um, through that has, has an opportunity to have more of a voice um, in an easier way um, than was possible before. And so the techniques and the way um, of engaging are constantly evolving. Um, so we want to um, talk a little bit about community engagement and focus today on what is authentic community engagement. What are the things that we can do um, to make it so that we're not just checking a checkbox of, you know, hey, we've done community engagement. Um, this often happens, um, especially in public health, because a lot of community engagement is mandated. It's a requirement to go talk to the community. And when that's the case, um, you know, often you're up against timelines and you're like, okay, we have to engage the community. Um, but if it's not done in an authentic way, it can actually um, be pro more problematic than 
than um, you're intending to. And so we want to we want to talk about what what is authentic community engagement um, and what does that look like. And and so when I talk about community engagement, we're really talking about um, working together with the community to improve the community. Um, and so the the real um, underlying purpose is this understanding that. Um, we don't want to do for the community. We want to listen to community members. Um, we want to we want to kind of partner with them, work with them, um, instead of the community being you know sole recipients. Um, and so we'll talk about some of those shifts and how we do that. Um, but we wanted to start off with a poll, um, and that poll is um, really asking you about how do you feel about your community engagement efforts currently um, compared to others? Are you lagging behind? Do you feel like you're keeping up? Do you feel like you're innovating? All right, that's interesting to watch the, the responses come in. Yeah, this is great. I just see a comment here from Diane too saying, I would love to hear from those who say they're innovating uh, and please share your examples. That's a great idea. And Diane, I saw that you're going to be at one of our sessions um, in Halifax. Um, and I'm during that session too, they'll be talking a lot about what innovative community engagement looks like as well. Um, so this is, this is roughly, you know, when I've asked this question before, this is roughly what I've seen um, in terms of you know, people feel like they're either lagging behind or, you know, keeping on pace. Um, less people feel like they're ahead of the curve when it comes to community engagement. And so hopefully, um, you know, the things we talk about today will help you feel like you have an understanding of, you know, what you're currently doing now and where you may want to go as you look to the future. So to start, we're going to ground in, um, in, Oops, I think we're both playing with the slides here. One second, I'm going to click it. All right, here's where, where I want to be. Um, and this is the um, what I call the community engagement continuum. Um, it's an adaptation from the IAP2 public, participa public participation spectrum. So many of you may be familiar with this. Um, our version moves it a little bit into the community change um, world. Um, and so I'm going to run through this because this is really our base foundation um, and the theory that we will then talk about how that's um, applied. And so I'm going to run through this um, so that we're all on the same um, foundational level. And so the, on the left, um, the kind of most basic level of, um, of engaging is really um, just communicating one way. And so this is in form. And so this is about providing stakeholders with a balanced and objective information to assist them in understanding the problem. So the style of that communication is just saying, here's what's happening. It's one way communication. It's educating the community on issues that are happening. Um, it, but it's not seeking any sort of response at all. Um, inform is very important throughout all community engagement because even if you're doing a deeper form of engagement, as we'll talk about in a second, um, it's really important that everybody has the same base of knowledge so that they contribute um, in an equitable way. Um, and so informing is incredibly important in all community engagement. The next level is consult. And this is about obtaining stakeholder feedback um, whether it be on, you know, your analysis or alternatives and decisions. And the style of that one is, here are some options, what do you think? And so this is the sort of engagement that you would do if you already have a plan, if your team um, or a, a, a subset of the community is working on coming up with some options for the community and you're really looking purely for their feedback. Okay, so they're... they're weighing in. So this is often where you see surveys coming in, what do you prefer, um, that sort of um, engagement. The next level is involve. And so this is about working directly with stakeholders throughout the process 
to ensure that their concerns and aspirations are consistently understood. And so as you can see there, it starts earlier on in the process. You're not going to them once you already have some options. You're going to them with a problem. You're saying, here's a problem. What ideas do you have? And so it's it's really involving the community earlier on and and saying, hey, we we want to hear your ideas. We don't want to come up with the ideas ourselves. We want to hear what ideas you have and then work um, work to figure out what's the best option for our community together. Because this is a continuum, um, it's often cyclical. So if you're involving the community throughout that process, you would be informing and consulting as well. So you might inform them about the problem and give them some stats and data about what that problem is. Then you might do an involving activity where you know you do some um, generative discussions or focus groups or um, or open-ended surveys or any technique where you're you're getting the community to start that idea generation. And then once you have some ideas. Later on in the process, you then met, might do a consulting activity where you say, hey, here are the ideas, let's vote on them, or what do you think about those? So you can see that um, as, a, as a continuum, um, at whatever level you're engaging, you're typically doing all the activities to the left of that. We'll move on to collaborate. So collaborate is about partnering with stakeholders in each aspect of the decision from development um, through to the solution. So instead of um, you as a public health authority um, saying this is our project and this is what you're doing, you might do it together with other community organizations or a neighborhood association or you're, you're getting together and working in partnership um, to solve the problem. And then the, the deepest level of engagement here on this continuum is empower. And so this is really shared leadership of um, community-led projects with the final decision-making at the community level. So you might help, um, help a community engagement process, but you would actually be saying, whatever the community wants, we will help implement. Um, and so often this, um, the roles are reversed where the community may actually be leading something and then they reach out to you and say, hey, can you support us? Um, and so the decision-making power is in the hands of the community. So what makes um, this process authentic or not is really about um, picking the right level. And so that means um, there's, there is not one best level. It's about picking the right level depending on what you're doing. Um, so if you already have some plan that's approved, you have no way to shape that plan from the community's perspective. It is what it is you should just inform. It's actually inauthentic to consult with them if you're not going to listen to what they say and feed what they're sharing back back into the plan and shaping it from their, um, from their feedback. Um, it's also um, inauthentic to, um, to consult um, and then um, not share back and not close the loop on, you know, here's what we heard, Here's what's going to make a difference. So that process of engaging and really wanting to respect um, all the ideas that come from the community um, and, and make them known that what you heard from them um, is, is actually shaping what's happening. Um, so really need to think about follow through. Really need to think when we talk about authentic engagement, um, it's about respecting um, a timeline so, you know, if you only have one month, it doesn't make sense to try to jump into, you know, some sort of really involved process if you actually can't follow through with that process in a way that's respectful, where you're actually listening to uh, an appropriate segment of the population. And so there's all these considerations in choosing the right level and then following through on the process that makes it so that you're really listening and respecting community members. So we're going to talk about some shifts um, that we see, you know, shifts, trends um, as we as we look towards um, authentic engagement from a place of traditional engagement. So the first one is really what is your role in engaging the community? 
So it's moving for, from this place of doing for the community um, to doing with the community. So moving from a place of seeing the community as a recipient of your programs and services to seeing the community as an active participant and a leader who can play a role in creating the future. So I've worked with some clients that, um, that you know, develop peer leaders, you know, as an example. So instead of seeing everybody as a recipient, it's saying, hey, how are you, how can you actually contribute to this because you really care about this outcome? Um, and this is an empowering process. When the community feels like they are involved um, and that they are an active participant, uh, they care more um, and it can actually be really beneficial. Um, often we're strapped for resources and we, we, we feel pressured because we feel this, um, this sense, this pressure that the community just wants us to go make it happen. And we feel like we can't do that. And so this shift in doing together with the community is really helpful because it takes the onus away from doing it by yourself and saying it's actually going to be a better outcome if we do it together. The next shift when we think about authentic engagement is thinking about who's involved. And so um, we, we use these terms content experts and context experts. And content experts are those professionals, perhaps staff in your organization, service providers, um, leaders, um, and they're the people who often have the formal training or knowledge or tools or resources to address the issue. Um, so for example, this might be a public health nurse, for example, would be a content expert. Um, and a context expert are the community members and they're an expert because they experientially know about the issue. They know about their health concerns. They know what it's like living in that environment. They know what it's like to access or have struggle to access services. And so we need to view their knowledge as expertise. And this is a big shift. Um, because if we view it as expertise, then we say, hey, we can't just create a solution in isolation. We actually need your expertise so that we're creating the best solution together. And so this shift of who is involved in coming up with solutions is really important. It's both the content experts together with the context experts. The next shift is really about what you're engaging for. So traditionally, we really only engaged in order to inform decisions. So you're looking to develop a program or a service and you want to shape what that looks like in the end. What we're seeing now is that there is a, it's equally important to engage in order to strengthen relationships. Um, we're seeing a lot of work that's necessary um, that we're calling pre-engagement. And that's really about building the relationships of trust so that you can bring people together and actually have open and honest dialogue um, with community members. Um, building trust is really important if you're working at deeper levels of that continuum. Um, and then the other reason that you may want to engage is to build capacity. Um, so as I was saying before, you know, there's programs where you might be engaging to get, you know, feedback from a wide, um, wide community group but then say, hey, who's actually interested in working more deeply on that and getting people to kind of step up and say, oh, I want to be a peer leader. And then you can say, OK, let's work on let's give you training. Let's give you tr training on how to facilitate a session or, you know, how can we equip community members and build their capacity to take on um, some of this work, whatever that may be. And so this is really important. And the way that you engage is different depending on what you're engaging for. And so this um, diagram and thinking comes um, from the Kapir um, engagement group. Um, and they're, they're actually consultants based in Australia. And they have a whole slew of resources on their website where they actually match, um, you know, if you're trying to engage to build capacity, they have suggested techniques of doing that. Um, whereas if you're um, engaging to strengthen relationships, there's different suggested techniques. And so I really recommend that as a resource as well um, to, to gain a deeper understanding of really figuring out what you're engaging for and trying to broaden the reasons why you may be engaging. The next one um, also related to why you're engaging 
is moving from this place from buy-in through to ownership. So buy-in happens when somebody else has developed an idea and they've made a decision and then and they, they've perhaps created an action plan and then they're wanting you to also think it's a good idea. So they, you know, they talk to you about it. Um, there may be a video explaining it and they want you to say, that's a great idea. Let's get on board. Ownership, on the other hand, is when frontline um, staff or citizens, the community, they help develop the idea and they're making decisions and they're designing the action plans based on it. So they're not hearing about it later on and then buying into it. They have ownership because they've been, they've had a stake in developing um, it from the beginning. And so as we look back at the continuum, you know, you can, you can get buy-in through informing and consulting. If you do a good job of informing and a good job of, of consulting, um, you can for sure get community buy-in. If you're wanting community ownership, which can be incredibly important for a lot of scenarios, you need to be engaging more deeply. You'd be looking at the involve, collaborate, empower levels of engagement if ownership is something that's important to have at the end of your process. And then um, the last one is really thinking about how you're engaging. Um, we talk about, or well, the traditional way of engaging um, is surveys, right? There's surveys, there can be surveys in public, there can be online surveys, and it seems to be our default way of doing it, um, often because the tools are easy to use and often free. Um, but there are so many ways that we can engage with the community. And so we really wanna think about, you know, having a way of engaging that's exciting, that um, raises up the voice of that context expert um, and really um, offering them opportunities to share and validate um, their thinking. And so I'm not going to go into these. I just wanted to show um, basically the vast range of options that are open to us um, when it comes to engaging. And we really need to be thoughtful in thinking about all right, based on this technique, what's that going to do? What's, how's that gonna make the community member feel? Um, how does that elevate the voice of the context expert? So these are, these are some of the, um, the um, shifts that we're seeing um, as we head towards um, authentic engagement, thinking about who you're engaging, why you're engaging, and how you're engaging. And I have another poll question that I'm interested. Um, now that you kind of have this, um, this overview of community engagement and what authentic engagement looks, back, looks like, I'm wondering what's holding you back from engaging the way you want to? We often hear that people want to engage more deeply, yet we can tend to be stuck, you know, and we tend to be stuck consulting more often than we want to, and we'd really prefer to be involving or collaborating. Um, and so based on that, I'm wondering what's holding you back? Is it that you don't have buy-in um, from leadership or there's organizational restrictions? Is it that you don't have access to some of the online tools that make these you know, more, um, more engaging um, techniques available? Um, is it that you feel like you don't have the skills or resources? Or is it that you don't have enough time? And perhaps there's other ones too. These, these are just the ones that we, we see come up a lot. Yeah, that's interesting. There is a lot of organizational restrictions, you know, and especially some of the um, some of the um, some of the organizations that have been around for a while. You know, it's hard to be a bit more agile, you know, and take risks. Um, some of the deeper forms of engagement can feel risky, and so um, it's a process to really get that organizational understanding of why deep, authentic engagement is important. Um, rather than kind of staying shallow in that continuum. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so Heather is now going to jump into um, a bit of a case study of some work that she, engagement work that she's done in public health. You know, Lisa, it's really funny because um, that, that whole organizational barrier um, is so true. And um, when I was in public health and, and um, trying to to change the way that we do community engagement, there was a lot of pushback, and and so I remember telling them, let's just pilot this, let's just give it a try and see how it works. 
and so I, I completely understand all those who voted um, in terms of the organizational structure barrier. Uh, so the, I, before I get into kind of my case study, um, what I've been noticing in the public health world, and even though I'm not in public health anymore, um, I still follow it um, a lot. And it's really interesting to see that over the last few years, we're really seeing a shift um, in all levels uh, around public health and community engagement. Um, and so the Canadian Institute of Health Research has developed um, citizen engagement handbooks and strategies. Um, Canada's chief uh, public health officer in their 2017 uh, report uh, really highlights the, the collaborate to collect standardized data and engage citizens. And they spend some time in there talking about um, how to do this and the importance of it. And then in Ontario, because um, that's where I am, I was really excited about this year's Ontario Chief Medical Officer of Health report um, and how they talk about uh, collaboration, or collaborate to um, be community-centered and community-driven. And so this report was um, the other reason why I was really excited about it is because they kind of declare that that loneliness is now a real big public health issue. So I was really happy that this report was out there so that we can start using it and um, make changes within our community. Um, but they talk about being aware of how decisions affect um, people's sense of belonging. Um, we need to uh, enhance social capital, connection and partnerships. Um, and they also recommend investing in community. Um, and then at the municipal level, there's a lot of cities now that are, are um, putting together engagement strategies. And the city of Vancouver has an Engage City, city, Engage city Initiative um, and where they uh, provide opportunities for citizens and residents to provide uh, their ideas and suggestions around a variety of issues um, uh, around the city. And so uh, it's, it's, it, we're, we're getting the support um, from all different levels of government and you know utilizing these documents with your managers, your directors, um, and saying, listen, here are the recommendations from the, the chief public health officer. And if your um, provincial chief medical officer of health has such a report, really use these as a way to advocate to make change to the way that you are doing your community engagement efforts. So I want to talk about a healthy communities uh, plan. Um, so when I was working in public health, uh, I started off as the heart health coordinator. So in, in Ontario, we had a heart health program that was provincial. And um, about six years ago, the Ministry of Health shifted that heart health program and um, asked all the public health units in Ontario to develop healthy communities plan. And so, um, and I actually see that Alberta Healthy Communities is on the call here and they've done some amazing work too. Um, around uh, building healthy communities. <clears throat> and so uh, instead of doing the traditional way where we, we are the context, our content experts, and um, we are, uh, we develop the plan inside the health unit, we uh, decided this time, and I worked with my manager to say, you know what, let's try this differently. Um, I took some uh, asset-based community development workshops, um, and some community engagement workshops and said, you know what, let's try doing this differently. Um, so we knew we needed to do it differently. We knew we wanted to collaborate with multiple stakeholders. Um, and we knew we needed to have residents right through to uh, municipal government involved in creating this healthy communities plan for our region. We knew we needed to inform, we needed to consult, we needed to involve, and we needed to collaborate. And we also knew that um, with the funding changes and how government changes every four years, we wanted something that was sustainable and that the community owned. So no matter what happened at the government level, this would be able to be sustained. And so what we did is we started off with uh, a community scan. And um, I got on to any agenda of any group um, that would let me come on and I presented the concept, the idea, 
um, had a discussion with the group, and then did a scan saying, how does your organization or your group, um, um, how could they contribute to developing this healthy communities plan? And before I left the meeting, um, I handed out kind of a, a one-page questionnaire and then said, do you want to, to be involved in the initial planning? If yes, give me your contact information. Uh, and this was a really great opportunity to, to build a bit of trust because who am I to come into the community when I don't live in that community? Um, and also to start building the awareness of what this is um, and kind of get, kind of drum up that support. Then um, we went, uh, that, so from there we did a large community um, meeting and this is where, you know, kind of matching up to the spectrum it was, we did some consults uh, and we consulted with the group. We introduced the concept and we developed a shared vision um, with uh, 50 residents and 37 organizations. Um, and I just want to point you to that drawing up there. So we ha ended up having a visual vision of what this plan meant to our region and what this plan should include um, going forward. And it was, it was amazing because we also had both mayors of the two areas that this plan covered um, come and they actually endorsed this, this vision. Um, and before we left, because I, it was just sort of, it was me with a little bit of a group um, at the public health, we, we knew that we couldn't run, like move this forward without pulling people together. So I'm not sure if you guys, if you're familiar with the stakeholder wheel, before everybody left, we handed out the stakeholder wheel where we asked if you wanted to be in the core um, and in actual planning this. Did you want to be involved? Did you want to just be informed or not right now, um, but just, I, you know, let me know or tap me on the shoulder if you need me. And that was really great because when we, when, when we ended that meeting, I had 23 individuals from, from residents to groups to organizations who wanted to come together to help move this forward. So it became a, a one person or kind of like the health unit, one organization starting this, and then we went to 23. Um, after that, we had another large gathering um, where we talked about areas of focus for this plan. And there was a lot of discussion, and you'll see the lady there with the post-it notes. Um, we had lots of post-it notes, um, big, small, a lot of discussion, a lot of sorting and organizing. And this was a great opportunity uh, for people to uh, point us in the direction of where this plan should focus. And at the end of the day, we had uh, five areas of focus, which were children and youth are valued, uh, people are connected, the community is safe, our residents are healthy, and our community welcomes diversity. And um, and, and, and we actually had some uh, ideas and suggestions under each one of them uh, at the end of, um, of the day. And then we needed to know, well, how do we move these forward? And so this is where I pulled in our epidemiologist and she helped us to find some indicators, ways that we could measure these areas and move these areas forward. And this is where the, con like the content and the contact experts came in, uh, because traditionally we would look at the data and say, oh, the data says we, this community doesn't eat enough fruits and vegetables, so we're gonna go and we're gonna, um, uh, address that piece. And so we, what we did is we actually internally um, ranked which ones we thought we should move forward with. And then we took it to the community and we did some consultation and we had 25 indicators. And what was really surprising was the indicators that we thought should, we should use weren't the ones that the community wanted or thought we needed. And so that was really helpful because we would have went on a path that the community didn't see as a need or um, we should be moving forward with. And so this is where uh, a bit of tension comes in when we're doing community engagement work is that um, we, we need to stay within um, our realm of our, our focus or I call the box. You know, we do have parameters of where we can move forward and it's scary to, to open up um, the voices and hear 
things that maybe are not within our parameter. And so how we dealt with that was we, we said, you know what, here are parameters that the public health or that we can move forward. Um, however, we're not going to stop um, other things from happening because the community is huge and there's other organizations that can address the things that come up. So um, it was a little bit of scary. Uh, but we we rolled with it and we just let it happen and let it emerge and then we 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 sorted through where we could fit in and where we can't fit in. Um, and then the the fun part, um, as you can see on the, the the slide, there is a big hamster ball. And this was the fun part: is that we we took the indicators and the results, and we went to the community. So I got booths at uh, the the festivals that were happening throughout the time. And while the kids were running around in a hamster ball, which was great because you know public health and physical activity, getting our kids out there and running around, which was really great. And then while the parents were waiting for their kids, uh, we had them fill in. A survey and to make sure that they like that the that the the results the areas we were going to focus on resonated with them does it make sense the wording and everything and um, from those results we actually modified we modified the wording we modified some of the indicators um, and uh, and then this was also a way to promote what we were doing and get more support from the community and from those who didn't come to us. Um, we went to them. Uh, and then lastly, what we did is, from all of this consultation, we did one last, um, I call it collaboration, is we had um, conversation cafes where we took the results and the indicators and we had tables and you came to the table and we actually hashed out some really innovative ideas what's already going in the community what's missing in the community who can step up and do some of this work and we had a day-long conversation cafe dialogue where um, if you see on the bottom uh, right side of the slide we ended up having a bit of a, a story behind each of the indicators so what was what the, what's already happening in the community what does the data say where we're at and then um, what are some of the ways we can address this indicator? And we ended up calling this our report card. And so from all of this, um, we ended up with this. And this is just kind of the, we call this our framework. And so we, we went to the community, so the Haldeman Norfolk community, we went to every clubs and centers, and then we, we um, involved them all in the results. We evolved them all in the local indicators, and then we called it a blueprint, not a plan, but a blueprint of where we should go with our Healthy Communities Plan. And then what I really wanted to highlight on this document is that um, for public health, the healthy public policy was where we were mandated or we focused. So there's a box there so that we could see where we fit in there, and we were okay with whatever um, came out of this plan that fit into the public policy. And then there was healthy community grants. And you know, the, the, we saw that the public policy could influence the grants and the grants could influence the public policy. So we were okay with those two boxes. But we didn't want to, to, to not use or disregard the complementary priorities, the things that came up through this whole process that the community said was a need, um, we can't not do this, but it was out of the realm of what we were, we were allowed to do um, in terms of our, our uh, mandates. So we made sure that we captured it in here and that we tapped organizations on the shoulder to say, listen, this came out. Is this something that you could move forward and address? And then on the bottom is our visual vision again. And that visual vision really helped to carry the message and communicate the message. And um, people felt very engaged because they saw their words and their pictures um, in, in the document. So my lessons learned from this process is that it does take time. Um, it, this was about a year and a half in the making of getting all this together. Um, and I know within um, when you have funding and grants, um, they don't allow enough time for uh, engagement process. And that's where we as advocates need to advocate to our funders that we need more time and money to be able to do this because there was a lot of coffee. Um, 
and a lot of chats and a lot of meetings um, to be able to do this and that costs money. Um, you need to think outside the box and be creative and I am saying that in many ways is that um, we have parameters, we have mandates, um, so do we have to be a square? We have those lines, can't we turn our square into a triangle or into a star where we still have our boundaries but we're being very creative in how we deal with our boundaries. Um, and being creative in, you know, the live, ha the, the human-sized hamster balls. Um, going to, you know, the big thing right now is all the, the groups that meet at Tim Hortons and at McDonald's. Those are, are very valuable groups to, to engage with. Um, you can't do this work between 8.30 and 4.30. And so you have to be flexible with your time and you also have to be flexible of where you go. You know, the, the whole consultation where people come to you as an open house and you give them a time and a location, uh, it doesn't work anymore. So you need to be able to, to, to shift your time, shift your location and have many opportunities to be engaged. And then I did talk about the coffee part already. Um, be honest. So be honest with what's in scope and out of scope. Be honest to say, this is why we're doing this, but we're open to hearing other things. We can't guarantee that we'll be able to move forward with it, but we will, through this process, maybe find other groups who can move it forward. Um, and then this is kind of my favorite saying, is that community engagement and working with the community works at the speed of trust. And so by, by spending all this time in the community and going to the community organizations, getting on agendas, um, I started off with a one-person show. And when I left, there was 92 people on a list that wanted to be involved. And I actually had people calling me on how do I get involved in this project. And so you know when that happens, that all this time that we spent, that year and a half and that time in the community was well worth it because the foundation was strong and it was built. Um, the last thing I want to leave you with is planning your engagement. So here are some questions um, to help you in planning your, <clears throat> your engagement and really thinking through why you want to be engaged. So what is the purpose of your engagement? Um, what are the goals you're trying to uh, achieve? And, and we, we sat and we talked and we thought about it. We know we wanted to collaborate and possibly even move to empower. Um, and how do we do that? And then, you know, as Lisa said, you, you really actually need to use all the levels of engagement um, and how you, you move through that. And, um, and then, you know, determine who you should be engaging, who the best target is, um, what's your key message? That's really key and um, evaluate your efforts at every step. And this planning, the, these questions and stuff are, are in a planning document that Peterborough Public Health put together. Um, and I haven't been able to connect with them, but you can actually access their tool guide uh, for engagement. And um, as soon as I get the link of where it is, I will make sure that you guys, uh, you guys get that. Thanks, Heather. We, uh, you know, the, the obvious question straight after sharing both the theory of community engagement and some stories is, but how do I do it? And so um, we've worked with many organizations to develop community engagement guides, and there's a lot of resources available on our website. Um, the guide Heather's referring to in particular was one I developed together with the city, but they've recently been sharing that among public health circles. Um, and uh, I'm biased, but I think it's a really great um, descriptive guide um, if you're looking for the nitty gritty on how to do um, community engagement. And so we're hoping that we can share that. Um, if not um, a link, we can do that in the post event um, communications. It is a great document, actually. It, it has great <laughs> tools and resources. Like it's, it's well put together. So, yeah, I agree, Lisa. Um, as people are writing questions, I just want to share two things happening that are really relevant. Um, the first thing is really that um, we, on our website, which is tamarackcommunity.ca, we have a whole resource library with community engagement tools. That wheel of in, uh, stakeholder engagement wheel that Heather mentioned is a tool on our on our website, and there's a step by step on how to use it. So please, all of these are available free of charge. Just go and access uh, access um, the website for any resources. Um, we also have two events coming up that are both relevant to community engagement. If you're looking to go deeper. Um, so this one is the one that Diane's going to be at. Yay, Diane! Um, in uh, Halifax. 
And so it's a thought leader, uh, Max Hardy, is joining us from Australia, and we're going on a tour across the country, Halifax, Ottawa, Toronto, Calgary, and Vancouver. And it's really about community engagement, where we're putting citizens at the center. So he's going to talk about techniques of doing that and um, go deeper in those mindset shifts. Um, and then the other one um, that's happening is um, in Guelph. If you're in um, kind of Ontario and accessible to Guelph, um, there's a session coming up on respectful engagement, and it's focusing on strategies for engaging equity-seeking populations. Um, and so that's going to be a really great one-day workshop as well. Um, so I just wanted to call your attention to um, to those. Um, and it looks like we have some questions now. So over to you, Emma. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. I really liked how you dialogued and uh shared both some theory as well as a really nice illustrative example. I would encourage participants to post your questions and comments in the chat box and thanks to everyone for uh, a number of comments that have been raised already so far. Um, I've got two questions that I'll start to read now. Do you have any case studies or resources that speak to engaging among stakeholders holders who are often too reluctant to come to the table in terms of community engagement, uh, thinking of stakeholders that have a history of tensions, for example, racialized and queer folks and the police. Um, so that's the first yeah, I question. Can, I can definitely, this is crazy how, um, how often I'm asked questions related to this recently. And so I'm actually writing my next paper on exactly this topic. And so I might actually want to um, reach out to you um, directly to talk more about this. Um, but it's something we hear about a lot. And it, it um, you know, there's a lot of distrust or, um, you know, engage, community engagement's been done in a way historically that um, hasn't been respectful. And so people are hesitant to engage exactly as you're saying. Um, and so the question then becomes, what can we do from here? You know, what can we do first to acknowledge, you know, the, the role that we've played in developing that mistrust and what steps can we do to move, um, move from there? And so if you think about the reasons for engaging, building relationships, this is exactly a perfect example of where building relationships as the purpose of engagement might be really important. So I am writing this paper where I'm going to explore it more because I don't have an answer on the tip of my tongue and I there's going to be 20 pages of answer for you. Um, and I'm also getting together um, with my colleague Galen and he's the one who's um, leading this respectful engagement strategy. And in particular, it calls out, um, or not calls out, but mentions as examples um, relationships um, between First Nations communities or with certain um, population groups like LGBTQ groups um, as as examples of, you know, how to um, how to just foster these relationships. And then he and I together are doing a webinar, um, I think it's June 21st, where we're we're focusing the whole webinar specifically on that topic. And that webinar is now live as of yesterday for registration. So I'll make, I'll post that link in here as well. Um, so great question. Um, I, I would just say developing the relationship from the scratch and owning up to the mistakes made of the past is what needs to happen rather than, you know, having fear of engaging and then just not engaging as a result, which is what we see a lot of groups do. Was there anything Actually, that you would build, build, Oh, yeah, I say to, to, to build on that, um, speaking, like engaging with them one on one and having a conversation with them and talking about the project or what, what you're trying to do and, and then, you know, kind of building that relationship and that trust because if they understand, they trust you, there's one person that they know who, versus inviting them cold you know, coming to a, a meeting and they don't know anybody. So at least if you can have that conversation with them, you build that trust in that relationship that they're more likely to come um, and then feel comfortable around the table. So that's one idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it often just comes of a, a place of deep caring, right? And so if you're wanting to mend relationships, how can you care about this person and what's the most um, respectful um, way that you can work with them? through those issues. 
Great. Thanks to you both, and thanks for the question. There is another question uh, from the same person, but we'll just move on to uh, someone else, and if there is time, we'll come back to around two of questions from participants. Uh, so Aaron Cusack is wondering uh, about the case study. Were the community health grants linked to the community health plan? Uh, in our public health department, grants are the only source of funding as we have for our uh, only source of funding we have for our community work. My role as a health promoter is centered on community engagement, but we struggle to build trust without funding support from the department or government to actually provide anything to the community. Any advice for departments with limited resources and limited understanding of leadership of how deep community engagement can link to public policy? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the, the grants, um, were, were linked to the, the funds that we got from the ministry and were they were linked to the plan and they as long as they um, they were around the results or the indicators um, we were able to use that money to uh, work on programs and initiatives for it um, but we didn't there was a bit of hesitation in that in terms of asset-based community development um, the community um, has what they need. They had the resources, the gifts, the skills in the community, and we didn't want funding to be a reason why not to do something. And so, you know, when you when you pull the assets and the gifts in the community, and they they figure out, you know, what we have, what we need um, to move this forward, you know, but we just need hot dogs to have a have a, a street party or, or so forth that's where these grants could come in to, to help play but we didn't want the programs to solely be grant or funding because we all know when that gets pulled um, it stops and so by building and using what's at the grassroots level um, and the assets and the gifts and then you kind of marry that with the the, the funds and the money you have more sustainability piece to it. Great. Did you want to add anything, Lisa? Um, I was just going to say that asset-based community development is a way of working, um, as Heather mentioned. And so if you'd like to learn more about that, we also have a lot of resources specifically about asset-based community development. And just having a, an understanding and trying to share that thinking with um, the team might give you the confidence to move forward without fearing. Um, the, the funding um, issue. Um, and then we're, we're also doing a workshop specifically on asset-based community development in Edmonton at the end of May. So also check that out on our website if you want to go deeper into um, asset-based community development. And it's also, if you're, if you're looking or seeking funding, by having the community come together and utilize their assets and their gifts, they have a more strong voice and collaboration that funders, they can then go and request funding because they're working together. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, there is another question here um, related to peer engagement and peer leadership. So um, agencies that support peer work with honoraria, especially when folks are speaking of their lived experiences. So um, this person's part of a project that involves the rollout of a community virtual hub that involved quite a bit of community engagement. Is there a model or framework that, that you know of that involves giving a considerable amount of ownership of the virtual hub to the communities? Mm -hmm. Um don't have a specific example off the top of my head, but I would say exactly this way of working is so important. So building community members up, seeing them as peer leaders, training them, um, having them in charge of certain things. We see it a lot with communities of practice. Um, so groups of people who are working together and they're run by peers um, for each other. So it's this understanding that learning isn't always, you know, isn't, isn't and shouldn't always be top down and that we can learn a lot from each other and things that are done in different communities or um, across our communities but in different um, sectors and so gathering people together and um, and um, and really building them up and taking ownership of what what it is that they're developing Heather do you can you think of any like something that 
is shareable in terms of an example? Um, not in terms of, of a virtual hub. Um, I, I need a little bit. I, I would need to know a little bit more about this virtual hub and what what it is to do. Like what what is it? What's the purpose of it? for the community. So because when I thought about it, I thought, well, is that similar to, um, you know, community centers or neighborhood centers? And, you know, they they want the community to dictate the programming that happens in the center. Um, so, you know, is that kind of a similar way? So I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I need a little bit more to, to pull out models of frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, but to kind of add to this, though, is that when you're giving um, ownership to the communities or the community or the neighborhood, um, it's it's it is scary and things will emerge that are out of your comfort zone or your mandates and um, and just being okay and let it happen, let it be emergent because great things come out of that. And mm -hmm. whether you you know whether you can't do anything like you know what this is really out of our scope, be okay with that. Because you've got something in the community that's bubbled up that somebody else could possibly take over. And if we didn't ask those questions, we would never have known. Mm -hmm. Something that can be really helpful in addressing that fear is just really clearly describing what your role is um, if you come from that kind of content expert place. And so saying, my role here is to listen. You know, we want the community to support each other and generate ideas and whatever it is, my role is to listen. So you're not saying my role is to take your ideas and make them happen because that's where the fear comes in, that, that something will come up that you can't, um, you know, come full circle on. Um, and so really clearly explaining what your role is can be a helpful, um, a helpful tip um, in feeling good about um, giving over that ownership to the community. Thank you so much, Lisa and Heather, and to all participants for your time today. This has been a really, really interesting conversation, and it seems like there's a lot of interest in continuing the conversation. There's a, been a few opportunities listed in the chat. Uh, I will be sending around an email. Uh, you also can see Lisa and Heather's email addresses displayed, so I do encourage you to keep these conversations going, and um, hopefully... We will see a number of you at our upcoming conference happening less than two weeks away here in Ottawa, Public Health 2019. Uh, we also have a couple of forums, one on healthy parks, healthy people, and uh, the topic of social connections is going to be um, a very prominent theme at, at both the forum and our main conference. So um, I hope to meet some of you there. And thanks again to everyone for all of your support. This has been a terrific series. Um, I really have enjoyed today's session. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.